Today, Mini ITX motherboards are sold alongside regular ATX and Micro ATX motherboards featuring standard chipsets from Intel and AMD. You get a majority of the features of the big boards with the convenience of a small form factor, where you can use cases like the amazing Fractal Terra and jam in the latest graphics cards and CPUs into a tiny form factor. But this wasn't always the way. In fact, the origins of the Mini ITX standard we know and love today might surprise you. In this video, I'll attempt to explain a bit of the backstory of the Mini ITX standard, explain who was behind it, and what happened after its release into the market. To begin, we need to rewind all the way back to 1981, where IBM introduced the x86-based PCs into our homes, schools and workplaces. It is here we see the first incarnation of the IBM PC 5150 motherboard with its five expansion slots and cassette port. A few years later in 1983, IBM extended the IBM PC standard with more expansion slots, slightly reducing the spacing between the slots and removing the cassette port entirely. This resulted in the XT motherboard standard, by this time, clone manufacturers had already copied the 5150 motherboard and were quick to copy the new XT and make it the new standard for IBM PC compatibles. Both the PC and XT boards were sized at 216 by 279 millimeters and were designed to fit within a standard desktop case. In 1984, IBM released the PC AT with a brand new Intel 286 processor and a 16-bit external bus. It was seen to be the successor to the previously released PC and PC XT that utilized the 8088 processor and an 8-bit external bus. It was a big board, 305 by 315 millimeters. A few years later in 1986, IBM followed up the PCAT line with the confusingly named PCXT Model 286, which sported a reduced cost and smaller XT size motherboard that ended up becoming the base for the Baby AT layout found from 1987 onwards. Baby AT motherboards quickly became the default layout for clone makers. The common concepts of the motherboard were the power supply connector, placement of the keyboard connector, the first expansion slot, and the mounting holes. This way you could put a smaller board in a larger case and use the same power supply. This was especially helpful for upgrades. Throughout the 1980s and 1990s, the Baby IT sizing varied from the large size of the Morse KP286 you see here at 331mm to the itty bitty late 90s Media GX board, almost half the length, at 170mm. During this same time period, a few things were happening in the wider PC market which impacted the design and sale of these boards. Chipsets and ICs were being shrunken down and integrated into smaller packages. Boards could be smaller in size and cheaper to manufacture. During the early 1990s, it was common to see XT-based motherboards and systems being sold alongside the AT286 counterparts. It gave a bit of extra life to the XT, in particular as the Taiwanese-based cloners got boards very small and performance was quite good, especially when a V20 CPU was added instead of the regular 8088. It was around this time the turbo button became common. Ironically, it was used to slow the PC down and remain compatible with speed-sensitive applications and games targeted for the original 8088. As we progressed through the 286, 386, 486 and Pentium era, we started to see boards with increasing amounts of integration and relying on headers and brackets. This earlier example from around 1990 contained an embedded 12 MHz 286 CPU, has an integrated IDE and floppy drive controller, along with two serial and one parallel I.O. connection. The Acer multifunction chip M5105 was commonly found on cards like this, and in this case was integrated into the motherboard. Moving into the later generations of the Baby AT and the beginnings of the ATX generation, we started to see all-in-one motherboards, like this one from PC Chips. You could have a fully functioning multimedia PC without needing to use any expansion cards. I recently covered this on a video, you can check it out in the links below. One thing to note, even with this picture, there are more brackets that you can actually add onto this unit. PS2, two USB ports, infrared, and another serial port. One other thing to note here was the transition between AT and ATX. You can see here, on a board like this, we've got both power standards. These boards are designed to be mounted in either case style. In this one, the CPU positioning is not only poor for airflow, but it's blocking all three PCI slots from using longer cards. This is something I encountered while experimenting with this board in that video. And according to Intel's white paper on the ATX specification, this would render this board non-compliant. But I don't think PC chips or its users really cared too much. After almost a decade of the AT standard, Intel introduced Advanced Technology Extended, or ATX, in July of 1995 with a maximum size of 244 by 305 mm It was a forward-looking platform that also retained some backwards compatibility with the previous AT standard. There was some standardization proposed around the positioning of the CPU away from the RAM and the expansion cards, and routing internal I.O. to a sensible location for cable management. Importantly, it introduced the rear I.O. panel, 
and coming from the previous PC chips hybrid board, I can see why. PC building was a tangled mess back then. Intel also proposed the Mini ATX standard as a means for cost and size reduced boards. With a maximum size of 208 by 292 mm it was used in small form factor bare bones PCs. Intel dropped it from future revisions of the ATX spec, but it didn't stop a few manufacturers like Jetway continuing on with it anyway. In 1997, Intel introduced Micro ATX as a subset to the ATX format and set the maximum size at 244 by 244 mm. This size and layout was interchangeable with many baby AT and hybrid configurations, so it seemed fitting for this standard to supersede the others. Micro ATX boards tended to be highly integrated, have less expansion slots than the larger format boards, and continue to be targeted towards the smaller, budget-focused consumer. In 1999, Intel went another step further and introduced Flex ATX, with the maximum size of 229 by 191 mm for even smaller configurations. It was only slightly narrower and slightly shorter than Micro ATX, and targeted size-sensitive applications while retaining case compatibility, expansion and upgradability options. In the late 90s, Via Technologies purchased CPU makers Cyrix and Centaur and wanted to introduce a new small form factor platform to showcase their investments into low-powered compute. ITX, or Information Technology Extended, was announced in early 2001 and Via announced a reference board VT6009 around March of the same year. Sizing was 215 by 191 millimeters and was only slightly narrower than Flex ATX. It had a different layout for case mounting holes and had a slot for a riser slightly off from the position of the PCI slot. Via had some big plans for ITX and saw the future of information PCs as a low cost, entry level offering for consumers and businesses that allowed them to get onto the internet quickly and cheaply using an expandable and upgradable format. Via also saw the use case for these ITX boards being in multimedia set-top boxes that could send and receive video to TV sets. While it was a well-intentioned format and concept, ITX didn't get much in the way of a following. Alienating existing case designs was probably not a good move, particularly when trying to promote an open standard. Manufacturers and OEMs largely ignored it and continued using Flex ATX or Micro ATX for these sorts of applications. If you've ever seen, or even have, an original ITX board from Via or anyone else for that matter, I'd be keen to hear your thoughts and experiences with it. Later in the same year, Via refined their approach and settled on a smaller square layout and called it Mini ITX. During October 2001, the VT6010 reference board was announced, measuring it at a maximum size of 170 by 170 millimeters. This is the design we're familiar with today. A heavy focus on integration, standard ATX compatible layout, and mounting holes so that you can use existing ATX cases if you wanted to, even this ridiculously large one. While the proprietary riser slot disappeared, the supplied PCI slot could support two devices, meaning you could either use a cable or splitter card to use two PCI devices at the same time. The white paper refers to the use case for Mini ITX being an information station, a low cost set top box using reference components. It just so happens I have one, albeit with a slightly newer chipset than the launch model. This particular unit was once serving as a DNS server for a business before I snapped it up on Facebook Marketplace. After announcing the reference boards, VIA released the EPIA line of boards. EPIA stood for Embedded Platform Innovative Architecture. The first of these boards, EPIA 5000, was released around April 2002. Throughout the EPIA lifecycle, VIA offered two common CPU types. One, a low-powered VIA or C-branded processor with active cooling. Two, an ultra-low-powered Eden-branded processor with passive cooling. Early boards contained an integrated graphics solution from Trident, the Blade 3D. Future boards would feature the rebranded and rehashed solutions from S3 Graphics. The Savage, Unichrome and Chrome would be iterated throughout the next decade. Via saw the Mini ITX platform as a way to bring in accessible, low-power compute to both developed and emerging countries. The PC1 initiative, an aim to bridge the digital divide and get devices to the next billion people, one concept was to get a complete PC under $300 US and get these out to countries and areas where the general population couldn't afford mainstream offerings. VIA had many initiatives at the time including focus on carbon reduction, solar power and setting up centres in remote communities to increase computer skills and literacy. The motherboard on the right is the example of one of those mini ITX boards VIA had in the PC1 initiative. This is the Gigabyte GA PCV2 and I covered its iGPU and performance in a previous video. While VIA put Mini ITX forward as an open standard, they weren't the only ones thinking small around the turn of the millennium. Shuttle claimed to have released a motherboard at the same size as Mini ITX in 1998 and sold it to OEMs. The closest I could find that matches this picture is the Shuttle FE22 based on the Intel 810 chipset. 
Interestingly, they refer to this motherboard as being 170 by 170 millimeters Flex ATX. Although Shuttle are an important part of the history of the modern small form factor PC, for the most part they were known for proprietary implementations and weren't really an open reference standard. Shuttle focused on trying to bridge the functionality gap between tower PCs and small form factor PCs by promoting bare bones kits that had optionality for disk drives and full size expansion cards. There's an old article on a silent PC review from around October 2004 where they interview Ken Huang from Shuttle and he talks about the FE22 and the OEM in question, HP. My take is that the FE22 was sold approximately in the year 2000 and didn't appear to be overly popular. Shuttle persisted and ended up bringing some of the design from the FE22 into the Spacewalker SV24 mini barebone kit in late 2001. Incidentally, the FV24 mainboard in that kit is slightly larger at 175 by 190 millimeters and uses a VIA PL133 chipset which was actually in VIA's Mini-ITX launch chipset. Shuttle's efforts weren't the only ones close to the Mini-ITX standard. Boards like the Flexus P6F135 mostly conformed to the Mini-ITX layout, but allowed other Socket 370 CPUs to be used. It took Intel until 2007 to find interest in releasing a Mini-ITX motherboard. They cared so little, that they didn't even bother using their own chipset. They instead used an SIS-based chipset, with an embedded single-thread Celeron processor based on the Conroe family of CPUs. Come to think of it, this is one that might be interesting for some Windows 98 retro gaming. It was around this 2007 to 2010 period we started to see more and more reviews and articles start to surface around Mini-ITX. Chipsets were getting more compact and manufacturers were finding ways to jam even more in a small space. This AM2 based example from Albatron came with an ATI iGPU and used sodium memory, presumably to save space, in an otherwise heavily populated board. Zotac released an Intel Socket 775 based Mini ITX board. It had a PCI Express x1 slot and an NVIDIA GeForce 7050 iGPU. Perhaps it was a precursor to the cheaper NVIDIA Ion platforms we would see shortly after. Around the same time period, AMD decided to make its own small form factor motherboard standard and call it DTX. I'm not sure what the D stands for exactly, but I'm presuming they meant for it to be desktop, or simply existing after the ATX and BTX standards. Both are 200mm wide, or 30mm wider than Mini ATX. DTX had a depth of 244mm, and Mini DTX had a depth of 170mm, the same as Mini ITX. This Asus ROG Crosshair 8 Impact is an example of a Mini DTX board. It got some attention when it launched back in 2019 because it looked like many of the other Mini ITX boards that were released at the same time, but it was slightly longer and hence got the Mini DTX designation. Throughout Mini ITX's journey, consumers have had the choice of either low power embedded or socketed CPUs, and the platform has continued to target a variety of markets and applications. There were some notable releases, and here are some of them. After a less than stellar launch of its Mini ITX offerings a year or so prior, Intel released Little Falls in 2008. It bundled the Atom-based low-power mobile CPU and a version of the 945 chipset with integrated GMA950. This board was very popular and found its way into a variety of industrial, commercial and consumer devices. A year later, Nvidia hit the Mini ITX platform with its Ion chipset. It had a decent GeForce 9400M iGPU and a solid feature set that made it desirable for media center PCs. AMD tried all sorts of things during the early 2010s and found their Bobcat Low Power Mobile CPU embedded in a variety of AMD Fusion branded motherboards. They also released their first desktop CPU GPU combination, the Lano APU, around this time, and it found its way into some of the higher end Mini ITX boards. Mobile on Desktop, or MODT, was all the rage in the commercial space, and it did find its way to a limited consumer market as well. It used laptop parts for the CPU and memory and provided a rich set of chipset and I.O. for integrations. But for me, the real fun started when companies like MSI started branding the Mini ITX boards with their gaming and enthusiast sub-brands. All of a sudden we were seeing Mini ITX branding appear on graphics cards designed to fit these full-featured motherboards. VIA continued chipping away at the emerging markets and set-top applications, quietly iterating their products. During 2011, VIA released a free ebook on Mini ITX called Small is Beautiful as a way for them to celebrate 10 years of the Mini ITX standard they introduced. It outlined some of the initial aims, ambitions, and explains how some of its own marketing probably wasn't the best at the time. 
There's a large section dedicated to case mods for the Mini ITX platform. It heavily relied on the enthusiast site miniitx.com, which is still going along today. I recommend checking out this site as people are still finding inventive ways to jam Mini ITX boards into all sorts of things. Unfortunately, I don't have all of the ebook here, I've only got part of it, and most of the links and archives appear to be dead. If anyone's got the original and complete PDF of this ebook, please get in touch. Post the release of the ebook, there are a few more releases of the EPIA platform. 2012's M920 appears to be one of the last ones sporting the VIA-owned processor family. It was notable for having the C640i GPU, which was a PCI Express-based iGPU, one of the last ones produced by S3. I'm unaware of too much else released post-2012. VIA sold off a fair bit of its IP, and it seemed to just roll on with existing inventory and focus more on the industrial and application market. It also marked the end of the 10-year cross-license grant that Intel gave them as part of a 2003 settlement of legal disputes between the two parties. This was until October 2022, when the M930 appeared. From what I can tell, it's the first EPIA board without any VIA-based chipset or chips. It's basically an embedded Intel board, which feels like a bit of a full circle moment. Mini ITX remains the smallest x86 motherboard standard that's regularly sold alongside other sizes, and it has at least one expansion card slot. The industry has changed quite a lot since Fire introduced Mini ITX in 2001. Initial target markets for Mini ITX can now use NUC or any of the single board computer platforms around today. Most don't need the expansion capability that Mini ITX can provide. Motherboards are sold at a higher price premium and can be found combined with a high powered GPU and CPU combination jammed inside a tiny case. There are YouTube channels like Optimum Tech for example where he has done some amazing builds over the years and is constantly pushing the limits of a Mini ITX platform. I've linked this video below in the description. I recommend checking out his channel if you're interested in Mini ITX enthusiast builds. There were many more x86 motherboard formats I could have covered in this video, but I wanted to keep on track with boards regularly sold alongside micro ATX and ATX size counterparts. What were your experiences with Mini ITX? Did you have one of the VIA ones as your daily driver, or did you get in a bit later? Are you using one today? I'd love to hear your comments down below. I first got in during the Intel 4th Gen Haswell days with a Gigabyte based Z87 board. It was rock solid and is still kicking today, with a 7870 MIS GPU serving as a media center for one of my mates. Today I'm rocking an X570 based Aorus ITX board from Gigabyte, and I'm using this to edit this very video. Okay, well that just about wraps this up. If you're still here, thanks for being part of the 25% Club. If you're new to my channel, Please feel free to check out some of my other videos, including the one I did about the PC1500 Mini ITX board discussed in this video. I plan on doing a few more of these part documentary, part explainer videos, just for something a little different. I've also got a lot more retro projects on the go and hope to share some more videos very shortly. Take care and bye for now.